Good morning, I'm Marg, and I'll be leading us in the Bible reading this morning. Isaiah chapter 52, starting at verse 13. The passage is a prophecy um, written hundreds of years before Jesus died, and it explains the uh, horrific agony and all that Jesus went through to secure our salvation. If you don't have a Bible and you'd like a church one, please raise your hands and one will come to you. And if you get one of those Bibles, you'll find the passage on page 600. So we have two chapters this morning. We're starting chapter 52, verse 13. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond any a human being, that of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were to- not told they will see, and what they have not heard they will understand. Now chapter 53. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore... I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. This is God's word. Hey, how are we? Good to see you all again. If we haven't met, my name's James, one of the pastors here, and Delighted to be opening up God's Word with you. Um, And we're continuing in our series uh, in Isaiah, which we've called A Better Story, because um, in Isaiah, God's speaking to his people coming out of exile. He's speaking to us today, and he's calling us to lean into, to trust the better story he has for our lives. And, And so today we come to a chapter in Isaiah that is one of the most profound and rich passages in the book of Isaiah, in the Old Testament, in the whole Bible. It's known as the uh, song of the suffering servant. Now, for, that, what that means for some of us is that this chapter is really, really well known for us. Like if I was to say to you, we like sheep have gone astray, you want to sing, and the Lord has laid on him, sing it, Isaiah 53, 6. 
Now, if that was completely strange to you and because you didn't grow up in church or haven't sung that song, that, that, that's fine because you can uh, look at uh, verse 4 and you see that uh, it says that he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Uh, verse 10, you can look at where it talks about being an offering for sin. Uh, and verse 12, uh, he, he bore the sin of many. And, and you don't need to be a Bible scholar to just look at that and go, hmm, that sounds a lot like Jesus dying on the cross. And if we look more closely, we can see how this chapter absolutely prophesies, prefigures Jesus' story. His humble origins, his suffering and persecution, his death on a cross, his resurrection, his, his glorification and vindication. And, and we could go kind of like line by line, verse by verse through this chapter and say, yeah, you know what? That happened to Jesus. J Jesus did that. Jesus suffered that. In fact, at least seven times the New Testament quotes this very chapter about Jesus. Even Jesus himself at the Last Supper in Luke's Gospel, when he's talking about, thinking about his death that's to come the next day, he quotes verse 12 that he is numbered with the transgressors. Jesus identifies with this passage. But here's the thing. Because it is so familiar to us, because it so clearly points to Jesus, the danger is that it doesn't have much impact on us. We can be a little bit complacent or casual or even careless with this chapter. I, I kind of felt that as I prepared uh, this week. It it's such a well-known passage and I'm thinking, well, okay, you've got to make sure you cover everything, you tick all the boxes. And so I found myself becoming quite formal and professional with this passage and, and that's not right. I, I wasn't doing what I said we should do last week, which is when we hear God's word, when we understand God's word, we should respond in praise and worship. I wasn't doing that. So here's my prayer for us today, that by God's grace, each of us would be surprised by God's power, shocked by what Jesus did, and stunned by God's grace. So let me pray that that will happen today. Father God, we're here today and for some of us, that's been difficult, whether it was wrangling kids through the rain or whether there's other things going on in our lives with mental health or loneliness and a thousand reasons not to be here, and yet you have brought us here today. And so we want this to be profound and powerful for each of us as we sit under your word. With all that's going on in our lives, all the distractions, all the other voices that make it hard to listen to you, we want to ask that you would enable each of us to be surprised by your power shocked by what Jesus did for us, and so stunned by your grace. We pray this in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. Well, firstly, we want to be surprised by God's power. So to put it uh, simply, uh, God's power works in ways that we don't expect. Um, God's work in the world will often won't look impressive to the world and to humans. And so here in this chapter, we see this massive gap between what God says about his servant and how humans think and react to the servant. So, so let's look at what God says about his servant. Verse 13 of chapter 52. See, my servant will act wisely and he'll be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Now that last uh, line, the second half of the verse, is exactly what Isaiah saw in the temple in Isaiah 6 at the very beginning of his ministry. Do you remember this? In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. That's what Isaiah saw. We, we sing that song, uh, Behold our God, seated on his throne, come let us adore him. That's what Isaiah saw. And then we get to Isaiah 52, and God says, My servant will be exalted like I am. And then verse 1 of chapter 53, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? That the arm of the Lord is his direct, powerful intervention in history. Like in the Exodus, when he rescued his people out of slavery in Egypt. You know, the plagues, the parting of the Red Sea, the destruction of Pharaoh's army. Powerful act. And, and so back in Isaiah 51, if you've got your Bibles there, quickly flick back with me to verse 9. Isaiah 51 verse 9, we read here, Awake, awake, arm of the Lord, 
Clothe yourself with strength. Awake as in days gone by, as in generations of old. Was it not you who cut Rahab to pieces, who pierced that monster through? Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made a road in the depths of the sea so that the redeemed might cross over? Those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them and sorrow and sighing will flee away. You can sense the mood there, can't you? Yes, God is going to act in power again to rescue his people like he's done before. It's exciting. That's how God sees his servant, exalted and powerful. But then look at how people see him. Verse 2, he grew up before him. So the servant grew up before the Lord like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. This is where the uh, modern kind of popular images of Jesus get it so wrong, right? They present him like this, kind of very European and a bit kind of, I don't know, lame, really, a bit uninspiring. Uh, Or as some kind of blonde uh, or blue-eyed kind of Nordic type Viking person. I don't know, blue eyes, right? Or or just a bit of a lad. (laughs) And the reality is that actually Jesus would have looked very much like an ordinary, unimpressive looking Middle Eastern man. But people didn't see that. They didn't see who he really was. They just saw this ordinary man. But even worse than that, look at how he was treated, what happened to him. I've summarized it on this slide as you go through. People were appalled at him. He was disfigured. He was marred. He was despised. He was rejected. He suffered, experienced pain. He was hidden from us. He was despised and held in low esteem. That last phrase, low esteem, is kind of like an accounting term. It means that they didn't count him worth much. He was of little value to them. Do do you see what's going on here? God says that my servant is exalted and, and powerful and humans say he's ordinary and despised and worthless. How, how is that possible? We humans have a horrible instinct, a, a, a terrible read, a, a poor grasp on how God actually works in the world. So often what we value, what we cherish, what we expect is so far from how God works in the world. What's so important to God? So, so how do we get this right? How do we fix this? We should expect God to work in ways that will surprise us. I know that's kind of a contradiction, isn't it? You wouldn't expect it, but he's going to work in ways that surprise us. And what he does is going to look unimpressive to the world. I mean, the best, most powerful example of that is when Jesus died on the cross. He looked defeated, a failed Messiah. But it was actually his moment of glory as he died for sin. God works in ways that surprise us, that look unimpressive to the world. So I want to say to you today, just because you might feel today very kind of beaten down, um, really kind of weak and unimportant, unimpressive, it doesn't mean that God's not working. It doesn't mean that God's not with you. Remember what Paul prayed. He prayed about a weakness he was struggling with and he asked God three times to remove that from him and God said to him, my power is is made perfect in weakness. Paul, you're not going to be impressive, but you will be powerful by my grace. Think about it. How how do people grow in their faith? How do you grow in your faith? Most often, it's not through impressive, spectacular ways, but it's through patient Bible reading and prayer. A couple of weeks ago, there was a visitor here at Norwest. I was talking to him after the service And he seemed to have enjoyed the service. He was quite positive about Norwest. And in the conversation, he said to me, so what's your strategy for growth here? It's a strange question. Uh, I've never been asked before. Um, And I said to him, well, we teach the Bible and God gives the growth. And he looked surprised. Like I don't think he was expecting that as an answer. It's not impressive. (laughs) And we feel that too sometimes, don't we? You're talking with someone and say, I'm really struggling in my faith. What do I, what do, I do? How, how can I be helped? And, and we say, well, you need to be in God's word and prayer. You need to let God to do that deep work in you. And, and there's a part of us that says, that doesn't feel like enough. 
Like we know what the right answer is, and yet there's a part of us that wants something more spectacular, something dramatic, or just quicker. But most often God brings profound change in our lives through that deep, patient work in the Word, in prayer, in community. It's not obvious. It doesn't look impressive to the world, but it's how God works. So we should be surprised by God's power. And so then we should be shocked by what Jesus did. Look at how shocking this is. Verse 8 and 9. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Jesus was innocent free of guilt, and yet by oppression and injustice, he was murdered. Verse 5, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. That word pierced is not a surgical term. It's not like a gentle stabbing. It's the image of someone being driven through with a sword, impaled. And the word crushed there is the word used for being trampled to death. Did you see how shocking and brutal the violence is here? And it was unjust. Now, you might be thinking, okay, yes, it is shocking. It is terrible. But what about all the countless people throughout human history who have been unjustly murdered? How is it any different? Verse 8 and 9, he was unjustly killed. Verse 10, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. This wasn't a random act. It wasn't just the vic- Jesus wasn't just the victim of injustice, but it was God's will. God planned it. God mapped it out. God decided, God intended Jesus to die. Now, you might be thinking at this point, that seems really unfair. That God would do that to his son? That seems very unfair. Is it some kind of cosmic child abuse? Now, look at verse 4. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. He took them upon himself. And then verse 7, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. He allowed himself to be killed. There's a moment in Matthew's gospel when Jesus is arrested and one of his followers pulls out a sword to try and defend him. And Jesus says this, put your sword back in its place. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he would at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Jesus was not a helpless victim. He had agency. He had choice. And he chose to die. So when you think about Jesus hanging on the cross with the nails driven through his hands and feet, what do you think was strong enough to keep him there? The nails? Jesus could command a storm to be silent and still with his voice. Nails aren't keeping him on the cross. Was it the soldiers guarding? Well, Jesus had legions of angels at his command, not the soldiers. What kept Jesus on the cross was love. So what kind of love? Because some people will say, well, Jesus' death was sort of just an example of love. He wanted to show us how much he loved us by dying. But that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Because think of it this way. If I took you on the bridge climb, brought you up, we're up on the beautiful view of the harbour, and I said to you, look, I brought you up here today because I wanted to show you how much I care about you and how much I love you. And and I want to show you. And so I walk over to the railing, I unclip myself from the harness, climb up on the railing, and I say, watch how much I love you. And I just launch myself off the bridge and plunge to my death. Now, as you see me going down to my death, you're not like, oh, wow, he really loved me. That's not what you're thinking, right? You think, what's wrong with that guy? What point, what point was that at all? Like, what did that achieve? And that's exactly the point here. Jesus' death wasn't just an example of love. It had a purpose. It achieved something. He died to save us. Verse 5, he takes our sin, our transgressions upon himself. Not his, he takes ours upon himself. Verse 6 is really, really clear, very famous verse, as we sung before. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
that each of us turn to our own way, that's talking about the heart of sin. So the heart of sin isn't that we just do the wrong thing or think the wrong thing or say the wrong thing, but it's that we've each turned to our own way. We've rejected God and tried to live our own way without God. And Jesus took the penalty and the punishment of that for that on himself. He substituted himself in. It was a substitutionary sacrifice. He stepped into our place. Now, I think one of the uh, helpful ways to explain that is uh, the book illustration. I don't know if you've seen this before. Imagine that this is us and God's up there. And this is what we were created for, to live in God's world under his gracious rule and have this open relationship with him. And imagine that this is not a Bible, but a record of all our sins. And it's heavy. And this blocks our relationship with God. It's broken. We have no contact, no engagement with him. And what Jesus did is he came and he said, I will take those sins upon myself so that our relationship with God is restored and opened up again. It's a really helpful illustration. Like all illustrations has limitations, but it's helpful, isn't it? So what's your reaction to that? For some of you, that might be the first time you've seen it put that way, that clearly. You might have amazement, you might have doubts, you might have questions. Today would be a great day to talk to someone about those questions and those doubts. Someone you know here at Norwest or one of the staff that you've seen up on stage, we'd love to talk to you. Or if you're in the position of where you've heard that before, you're very familiar, you've seen that example before, you know it really well. Don't let your reaction today be casual or neutral. Like, I know that, I've heard that one, I've seen that one. We should be shocked at what Jesus did. The beautiful, perfect, amazing Son of God willingly died on a cross for our sins and in our place. That should shock us. And that shock and amazement will keep us stunned by God's grace. Have a look at verse 11 with me. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. By his work, the servant will justify many. They will move from being guilty to righteous. That's really important to get clear because Jesus' death doesn't just forgive our sins, doesn't just wipe the slate clean, doesn't just give us a fresh start, but Jesus gives us his righteousness, his perfection. Apostle Paul in Ephesians 1 puts it this way, that because of Jesus, if you follow Jesus, we are holy and blameless in his God's sight. Did you get that? If you follow of Jesus, you are holy and blameless in God's sight now. Not, not that you've got to work on it over time and build towards it. And I get more holy, more blameless, and one day I'll be a bit better. No, no, you are holy and blameless in God's sight now. God looks at you. He doesn't see your sin and your brokenness. He sees Jesus' perfection. So that really means that you're ready to meet God right now. If you died tonight, horrible tragedy on the way home or later tonight, if you died tonight, you are ready to meet Jesus now. That's stunning, isn't it? Are you stunned by God's grace? Help us kind of keep processing that and pressing on. I want to share with you a story. It's about a guy called Maximilian Kolbe. He was a Catholic priest, uh, and he was sent to Auschwitz during the Second World War, prisoner 16670. And while he was in the camp, uh, there'd been an incident in the camp, and the commandant decided that uh, to teach everyone a lesson, 10 men would be chosen and executed. And one man who was chosen, a uh, name called man by the name of Francis, a Polish Jew, uh, was chosen, he was pulled forward, and as the realisation of what was about to happen to him hit, he fell to his knees, he was sobbing, tears pouring down his cheeks. He said, what about my wife and my kids? What will happen to them? Well, Maximilian Colby didn't have a wife, didn't have kids, and so he stepped forward and he said, please may I take this man's place. Now this appealed to the perverse humour of the commandant, so he agreed, but it wasn't to be a simple execution. The ten men were placed in a large box where they were left 
to freeze in the cold and sweat in the heat, to starve to death and to sit in their own filth. Maximilian ministered to those nine other men in such a way that they just lasted and lasted and lasted until the soldiers in the camp got sick of waiting and so they pulled the ten men out of the box and shot them. It's horrible. Francis survived Auschwitz. He found his wife and kids and they emigrated overseas and he lived a long and fruitful life. It's an amazing story, isn't it? Such sacrifice. And yet here's the thing. No matter how well I might tell that story or how many details we might share about it, we never will appreciate it like the way that Francis did. Because we know that Maximilian didn't die for us, he died for Francis. He didn't sacrifice him for us, himself for us, he did it for Francis. So we have a kind of abstract theoretical relationship with the story. We say it's a great story, but it's not personal. And that's the danger for us with Isaiah 53. We know it so well that it just remains abstract. It's not personal. Great story, but it's not for me. And in our busy lives, it just becomes white noise or just the backdrop to our story. But when we slow down, down and we grasp Jesus died for me not just be able to say that or think it but to grasp deep within your being that Jesus died for me that 2,000 years ago when he was up on that cross it was for me for you when you grasp that it's not white noise it's the chorus of your life It's not a backdrop. It's the center of your story. So how has God spoken to you today? Because here at Norwest, we have a joyful expectation that God changes lives. So how has God spoken to you today? In a moment, I'm going to give you some time to reflect on that. And perhaps for you, it might be that you've grasped that Jesus died for you for the the first time. You really grasped that today. Today would be a great day to talk to him about that. That's what prayer is. Thank him, to praise him. Perhaps you've been reminded today that God's power is displayed in our weakness. So you want to ask him to sustain you and strengthen you. Or perhaps what you've heard today is you've thought about it, you thought, you know what, there's someone in my life that needs to hear this. to pray for an opportunity to do that this week, for the words to share. How has God spoken to you today? Take a minute to reflect, and then I'll lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to confess that many of us are a whirl of emotions. We're processing and thinking and pondering. We've got doubts and questions. Some of us are really struggling in life and really aware of our weakness and brokenness. And some of us are thinking of people right now who we know would so benefit from this good news that it would be life-changing for them. And so I want to ask, with, with all that's going on in our lives, with all the, the noise that's around us, the competing voices that distract us, that make it so hard to hear you, we pray that in the power of your Spirit, you would 
write these words, these truths upon our hearts and minds, that they would not be white noise, but the chorus of our lives. Not a backdrop, but the center of our story. That our lives would speak, and model, and sing of the Jesus who died for us in our place and for our sins. We ask this in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen.